For questions 1 to 5, choose 5 answers from A to H. Which of these statements about boomerangs does the speaker make? First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Most people probably don't realise what a clever thing a boomerang is. People think they're just toys or something used for sport. In fact, they were the very first objects made by human beings that were heavier than air and could fly. They were used for weapons and for hunting. The oldest Aboriginal boomerangs date back to 10,000 years ago. At that time, they would have been very advanced in terms of technology. The remains of boomerangs have been found in North Africa, India and parts of America but it's the Aboriginal boomerang that everyone knows about. When it's thrown correctly, it follows a curved path and comes back to where it was thrown from. Some boomerangs are only about 10 centimetres long, but the biggest can be over 2 metres. Not all boomerangs are designed to come back to the thrower. Hunting boomerangs, some of which are still used by Aborigines in Australia, are designed as flat throwing sticks and are used for hunting. These boomerangs that followed a straight path and flew very fast were actually more difficult to make, and it could be that the famous returning boomerang was actually invented by accident as attempts were made to develop a faster hunting weapon. Nowadays, boomerangs are made mainly for tourists. It can be quite difficult to learn to throw one so that it comes back to you, and you may need a few lessons before you can do it properly. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Of course, it's not really clear who exactly invented the television. A number of different scientists and inventors were working on similar projects at the same time. But a man from my country, John Logie Baird, is the man who created the first working television system. He first demonstrated his invention to the public in 1925. At one of London's most famous department stores, Logie Baird demonstrated how silhouette images could be seen to move on a screen. In 1926, he demonstrated his invention again, this time at his laboratory to the Royal Institute and to reporters from the Times newspaper. The quality of the projected image had improved greatly and the event is considered to be the first real demonstration of a television system. In 1928, Logie Baird developed his invention and demonstrated the first transmission in colour. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for 20 years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now. But that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television programme last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant though. Oh really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America, to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip. Professor Nitik, could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> an average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone, so there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20.
Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of 2001. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a conversation between the tutor and two students about the presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think we can start straight away by getting Rose and Mike to do their presentation. Would you like to start, Rose? Yes. Well, um, we've done a survey on local entertainment. Basically, we try to find out how students feel about the entertainment in the town and how much they use it. Yes, so we've called our project "Out and About." Yes, that's a good title, "Out and About." We wanted to find out how well students use the entertainment facilities in town, whether they go to see the latest plays, films, that kind of thing. Now we have our own facilities on campus, of course. Yes, we deliberately omitted those, as we really wanted to examine outside entertainment in the town. Actually. There were a lot of areas to choose from, but in the end, we limited ourselves to looking at three general categories: cinema, theatre, and music. Right. Okay. Well, first of all, cinema. In the town, there are three main places where you can see films. There's the new multi-screen complex cinema, the old park cinema, and the late night Odeon. So, if you look at this chart. In terms of audience size, the multi-screen complex accounts for seventy-five percent of all cinema seats. The park cinema accounts for twenty percent of seats, and the late-night Odeon has just five percent of seats. As you probably know, the complex and the park show all the latest films, while the late-night Odeon cinema tends to show cult films. So, when we interviewed the students, we thought the complex would be the most popular choice. But surprisingly, it was the late night Odeon. Yeah, and most students said that if they wanted to see a new film, they waited for it to show at the old park because the complex is more expensive and further out of town, so you have to pay more to get there as well. Yes, and that adds to the cost, of course, and detracts the popularity, evidently. Well, next we looked at theatres. The results here were interesting because, as you know. There's a theatre on campus which is popular, but there's also the stage theatre in town, which is very old and architecturally beautiful. And there's the large modern theatre, the Ashtop, has recently been built. So you just looked at the two theatres in town? Yes. What was interesting is that there are periods during the year when students seem to go to the theatre, and periods when they go to the cinema, 
and we really think that's to do with budget. If you look at this graph, you can see that there's a peak around November and December when they go to the theatre more, and then a period in April and May when neither is particularly popular, and the theatre viewing seems to fall off virtually, while the cinema becomes quite popular in June and July. Hmm, I think you're probably right about your conclusion. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, lastly we looked at music, and this time we were really investigating the sort of small music clubs that offer things like folk or specialise in local bands. So not musicals as such. And that's right. We looked at three small music venues, and we examined the quality of the entertainment and venue, and gave a ranking for these. A cross, meaning that the quality was poor, a tick, meaning it was OK, and two ticks for excellent. First of all, the Blues Club, which obviously specialises in blues music. This was a pretty small place and the seating was minimal, so we didn't give that a very good rating. No, we don't recommend that one really. Then the Sunrise, which plays a lot of South American music, was a big place, very lively, good performers, so two ticks for that one. The Pier Hotel is a folk venue, a good place for local and up-and-coming folk artists to play. Not the best of venues, as it's in a basement and a bit dark, but the quality of the entertainment was reasonable, and the lighting was very warm, so we felt it deserved an average rating. Finally, there's the Bald Rock Cafe, which features big rock bands and is pretty popular with students, and we enjoyed ourselves there as well, so total marks for that one. And then did you get any information from the students as to which of the clubs they preferred? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a local radio program giving information about jobs that are available in the area. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. This is Mandy. Good morning, Mandy. What's up in the employment world this morning? Well, Simon, this morning I have five jobs that have come in, and the first is for a dental assistant. That's located in Tunbridge, and it's two and a half days a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturday mornings. You've got to be at least 25 and the salary is £2,080 per annum and you've got to be experienced. The second opening is for a florist and this is according to experience as to wage and the age is open. The job is in Tunbridge Wells and the hours are from 9 to 6 Monday to Saturday and because you're working Saturday you get a day off in the week. Now, as that's a florist, you must be very experienced in all aspects of floristry and capable of working to a very high standard. 
Previous managerial experience is an advantage, as this job has actually got nice prospects、um, because there's a possibility of management for the right applicant. So there's one for someone who's going places. What's next, Mandy? Next job then, Simon, is an evening job, and it's for a cleaner. The wage is twenty-five pounds per week, and the age is thirty plus. Hours for this, as it's an evening job, six to eight thirty Monday to Friday. So that's a nice job for someone who wants to do something in the evening, Simon. Hmm. Hmm. They must be fully experienced as an office cleaner, hoovering, dusting, and polishing, etc. And where's that one based? Oh yes, that one's in Tunbridge. The fourth job we've got lined up is for general catering assistant, based in Paddock Wood. The wage is forty-eight pounds forty plus full board, so that's full board, and it's forty-eight forty. The age is eighteen plus, and there are alternate shifts on this job. It's seven a.m. to three p.m. and eleven thirty to seven thirty p.m. And the job consists of cleaning, washing up the kitchen, as well as serving in the dining room and all sorts of domestic duties. Experience is not necessary. So for someone who's eighteen plus, that's a nice little job there. And here's the punchline: ten weeks holiday per annum. Oh ho! Oh, I might put in for that myself. I can just see you up to your elbows in the washing up, Simon. Uh, last vacancy is for an office job. That's secretary and personal assistant based in Tunbridge. The wage is four thousand two hundred and ninety-eight pounds per annum. Now, there's a little bit of detail I must give here. It's part time to start with, three days a week for three months. So for the part time, it's three fifths of four thousand two hundred and ninety-eight pounds. And then after three months, it goes to a full-time job, nine to five. That's for someone twenty-one plus, and the job consists of work as a secretary, come personal assistant to social workers. You need fairly good shorthand and good typing speeds required, and it's also related to clerical work, answering the phone and reception, etc. And、um, because it's working for social workers. You need a responsible attitude and common sense. So, if you're interested in any of these jobs, get in touch with Tunbridge Job Centre on Tunbridge five five four nine nine and ask for extension thirty. And that's it, Simon. Thank you very much indeed, Mandy. By the way, that's your day's work done. You can just sit back now and do absolutely nothing. Wouldn't that be nice, Simon? Ha <laughs> ha! If only I could. That is the end of section three. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet. <laughs>